All right. Hello, everyone. We're live. Sorry, we're running a few minutes behind a schedule, having last minute uh, technical difficulties. But uh, super excited to be here with you all today. So we're streaming um, across multiple channels. We're live on Crowdcast, which is the main channel that you can see um, there. And we're also streaming on LinkedIn and YouTube. Um, so if you want to participate in this stream, which I suggest that you do, then uh, head on over to the Crowdcast, uh, the Crowdcast link. That way you'll be able to ask questions, participate in the polls, uh, and be able to chat to myself and the handsome Toma, who is joining me today. So Toma, welcome, welcome to this to the stream. Uh, I am the developer advocate at Gigardia, and Toma is one of our product managers. Toma, can you maybe introduce yourself to the audience for uh, a brief? <laughs> Hello, Mark. Thanks for having me. So I'm Thomas, I'm the product manager who is res responsible for the Has My Code Leaked product we've launched a month ago, which is helping you to find to find out if your private code has leaked on public GitHub, which is the subject today. Yes, right. That is the subject. So let me just share my screen for a minute. All right. So detecting source code leaks on GitHub. So that is the topic uh, for today that we're going to discuss. We're going to discuss why uh, that is bad. So we're going to talk about source code leaks in the news and a little bit about why we think this is kind of a trend on the up and up. We're going to look at some of the reasons why source code leaks um, and the security problems behind that. And then we're going to do our first ever live demo of a new product that we have, which Toma has been working uh, very hard on with the engineering team here at GigGuardian, which is a tool that's going to basically be able to detect your source code uh, throughout a uh, public environment, namely GitHub. Uh, and we're going to talk about some unique features that we have in the ability to do that. And then, as always, we're going to have a Q&A section uh, that you can uh, participate in. So as always, we have prizes. Uh, available. We have swag bags, and uh, today at the end, we're also going to have some Amazon gift cards uh, to give away. So you win those uh, swag bags by participating, asking questions, participating in the chat. So if you haven't said hello in the chat, say hello in the chat. Um, and we're going to have some polls. So participating in those polls uh, is going to help uh, as well. So the most active members will get some swag bags for uh, from Good Guardian as appreciation. So before we get started, let's have a talk about uh, where, where in the world is everyone tuning in from? Let me know uh, in the comments. Uh, Toma, you're in the office, it looks like. You're, this, is actually, this is actually the yeah. last day. The last day in this office. We're changing offices. It's moving day. Yeah. Moving day. So we're based, we're based in uh, Bastille in Paris, if you know Paris. And we're moving to uh, Le Opera, the area around the opera in Paris. If you haven't, if you haven't been, opera is like one of my favorite buildings in the world. It's the most opulent <laughs> building I think I've ever seen uh, in my life. Let me know where you are tuning in from, uh, so I can say uh, hello on your part of the world. So we've got some from Germany, Texas, Berlin, Singapore, Boston, Canada, Nigeria, Vermont, Wales. Nashville, Tennessee. My brother lives in Nashville, Tennessee. Finland, Poland. Wow, a lot of great places. India. Uh, I'd love to see this. Uh, we're getting uh, quite a lot more people in these webinars. We started off having, uh, I think our first webinar had about 290 people registered. Our last one, 750. And this one, we're on 450. So do you know what? I'm pretty proud of that. I think the numbers are going uh, pretty well. Okay, so we got our first poll here, which I'll just make live. And uh, why are source code leaks bad? So let me know what you think. Do you think that they're bad because they contain secrets, uh, possibly, uh, which obviously we talk a lot here at Guardian. Uh, are they bad because of lost IP, perhaps uh, losing the competitive advantage? The code is, after all, uh, an asset. 
does it expose other security vulnerabilities? So other security vulnerabilities could be things like, you know, maybe you have some business logic flaws uh, in your source code. Um, that could be a problem. I'm just trying to post this right now. Um, or do you think that source code leaks aren't bad? There's a lot of people, I'm one of them, that thinks that source code shouldn't be such a valuable asset um, so that if it does... Uh, there we are. All right, I've got the poll up. Whew, sorry about that. Um, so there are people that don't think source code leaks are that bad. Um, so I'm particularly one of them that we should aim to have our source code uh, to a point where if it does leak out in the public, it doesn't expose any serious vulnerabilities. But unfortunately, this isn't the world that we live in. And even if we aim for that, it's very hard to get there. So let me know. Um, all right, exposes security vulnerabilities. It's winning out of the gate. Um, so there are a lot of security vulnerabilities that can be exposed in our source code uh, and also tools that we can that we can use, which also can provide uh, attackers with kind of blueprints into our systems. 13 votes, 16 votes for exposing security vulnerabilities. We only have one vote for not that bad. I think that's quite good. <laughs> Two votes. All right. All right, so exposing security vulnerabilities is definitely um, <laughs> exposing security vulnerabilities with a typo. There we are, corrected that. Uh, all right, so that's the clear winner there. And that is true, source code does contain a lot of vulnerabilities that can be picked apart. Um, so we've mentioned business logic flaws, perhaps you'll be able to discover some cryptography flaws uh, in your source code. Um, you know, other areas like that. Obviously, we have the keys that are leaked. Uh, this is an, a big one um, that we find, but there's also a lot of other things that can be wrong uh, when your source code leaks out. So let's talk about some source code leaks that happen in the news. What are some of the headlines uh, that we're having, you know, at the moment? So we've, we've seen a huge trend of source code being leaked out. So you may have noticed in October, Twitch's entire source code was leaked. And then at the start of this year, we had the Lapsus group that were leaking just about everyone's source code. So we had, you know, Samsung, NVIDIA, I'll talk about NVIDIA in a minute. Um, some Microsoft code was leaked. So this is kind of becoming a prevalent, a prevalent problem. And these are kind of the main highlights. But source code leaking is, you know, a, a fairly a fairly big problem and can actually come about in lots of different ways. So we obviously want to make sure that our source code doesn't leak. But here's the main problem is that source code is a leaky asset, right? You imagine, well, once source code hits your Git repositories, it's basically broadcast into hundreds of different places, thousands of different places, and we have no idea. So if it's in your Git repositories, it's on your developer's machines. Maybe it's backed up into different areas. It's probably shared on your internal messaging systems. Now, all of these places we have no visibility over. And that's kind of one of the key things when it comes to source code leaks is that we don't have any visibility over you know, where the source code actually ends up. And we don't often know if we have a problem. So, you know, but uh, source code leaking into public areas specifically, like GitHub, you know, is still a big problem. So we, there's something called a, D, uh, a DMCA takedown. Now, this is part of a law, uh, a digital material law that basically looks at source code that's proprietary. So source code from a company that's been leaked into a public repository. So if this happens, one of the questions is, you know, what on earth do I do? What do I do if my proprietary source code is leaked uh, in a public repository, perhaps from a, an employee, a previous employee, or perhaps just from someone that's uh, using that, that code. So there is a process. You can you can apply for a, D, uh, a DMCA takedown to GitHub itself if it's leaked on GitHub. And we've seen the number of uh, the amount of these DMCA takedowns uh, really kind of skyrocket up to 2020. Um, and it's about one in 10,000 repositories. So we see the numbers on the graph, that looks pretty big. You know, we, there's huge amounts of DMCA takedowns that are being requested, but at the scale of GitHub, this actually isn't that much. So this isn't necessarily because that proprietary code isn't sprawled across GitHub. You know, we happen to know that it is quite a big problem, but it's just really hard to find. How do you find your source code uh, that's leaked onto GitHub. 
when you've got something at the scale of that, there's going to be thousands of files that will match uh, your particular code. It's going to be so there's going to be lots of different things that you're going to have to look out for. So it's really hard to one even find your code and know you have a problem. And then once you do, if you do, then you have to go through that legal process of making a DMCA takedown request, uh, which usually a process pretty fast on GitHub side, and that that code will be removed. And we'll take a little bit uh, more look at that. So the the problem is actually bigger than we expect. And it's also completely unknown. It's really hard to know how we how we do this. So how does source code usually leak? So we, I have some interesting examples to run through later. But uh, source code leaks happen in a couple of, of different ways normally. So unsecured version control servers. So when we take a look at the Twitch breach, um, so we'll we'll take uh, you know Twitch Twitch. Twitch's source code leaked in October. Uh, I've written a number of blogs uh, and done some videos on this. We found 6,000 credentials um, or secrets inside Twitch's source code. And uh, when we looked through it, that was leaked by someone as a torrent. But how did it leak in the first place? How did that bad actor get access to Twitch's source code? Well, they had a misconfigured version control system. Basically, it was public. Um, only for a brief period of time. And that would have come about because perhaps they were updating uh, their infrastructure or a couple of other reasons. But essentially, that their, their source code was was unprotected, and then it ended up out in the wild. And, and we'll we'll take a look. I know Toma has some more examples on Twitch's source code specifically about where that even ended up um, and how widespread that was. So we can have a uh, publicly exposed cloud storage. I don't know about you, but I've I, I can't count the amount of times I've read articles about a misconfigured Amazon S3 bucket. So if we're storing uh, data and code in these in these places that have misconfigured uh, that have misconfigured areas, then uh, security researchers, malicious actors are going to be able to find them. Uh, there's ways to kind of scan or fuzz areas to try and identify this. It's a common attack path uh, that is used. So this is another area where we where they end up. Uh, current or former employees and contractors. Now, now this is a big one too. This is interesting because we've we've talked a little bit about this in the context of secrets. Is that you know let's have a look at GitHub. GitHub's quite unique in that you probably have one account that's for your personal and your professional use. So if you're using GitHub at your work, you're probably using the same account for your personal use. So why is this a problem? Well, it's really easy to make a mistake and accidentally push code into the wrong repositories. And the other area of this, a slightly more kind of concerning malicious area, is that I mentioned the Laptus hacking group and some of the source code leaks that they did this year. Well, on their Telegram channel, they were basically advertising for insiders to give them access to internal uh, uh, infrastructure, including code repositories. So if you work for a large telecom company, uh, even if you know you don't have access to anything special, you probably have access to the, the, the Git repositories and an attacker uh, can move laterally, find other vulnerabilities in that source code and, and maybe leak that out to the public um, for a ransom, which is what happened in the case of Lapsus. So the, you know this this, the employees and contractors can kind of come at a lot of different areas. Uh, another one that I'm going to talk a little bit briefly about is the tooling that we use, misconfigured DevOps tooling. So we can implement this stuff in our CI CD pipeline that helps us a lot. It's great, uh, but uh, it can uh, accidentally expose or give access to different to different source code. Uh, uh, as we go through there, if you don't configure that right. So not only do you have to configure your version control systems, your data storage, you have to keep a check on your employees and what's happening, but you also have to make sure that all your tools are correctly configured because a small misconfiguration uh, can, can be a big problem. And then also fat fingering, you know, <laughs> accidentally making a repository public. The crazy thing about GitHub is uh, that GitHub has a, has a public API which means that when uh, code is made public, so in the case of you know a private repository being made public, this falls under the uh, the public event category, which is an event on the GitHub's API that just looks at when code has been gone from being a private repository to a public repository. Um, and this is by far probably one of the best ways to kind of find sensitive information that's not meant to be there. Um, and attackers, adversaries, security researchers monitor this. They monitor this GitHub API, particularly this, this type of event, to try and find uh, when code has leaked. 
all right. I'm just going to take a quick look in the chat, see if there's anything I need to address. But no, I think we're good. We have a few questions in there. Feel free to ask questions along the way. We'll probably only answer them at the end, but just so you don't forget. All right. So now let's talk about the real reasons behind the source code leaks. Um, so, you know, the ramifications of this. So we talked a little bit about in that poll exposing logic and security vulnerabilities. So, you know, this you, source code is like a blueprint. Now, uh, an attacker may be able to gain access to your application without it. But if they have it, then you can do a whole lot more uh, and a lot faster. You can run it through code analysis tools, for example, find vulnerabilities to really exploit um, areas in that. It also can kind of attract unwanted attention. Um, you know, in the case of uh, Twitch uh, and a lot of other areas, you know, the main headlines of that was that streamers' incomes were leaked. You know, if you look at the mainstream media and what people were reporting in that, um, it was the income of the streamers. Now, this isn't uh, in, the, in the world of things, you know, that definitely wasn't the worst thing that was leaked out. We found a huge amount of credentials that could have been used in much more malicious ways. Um, and thankfully, in Twitch's case, the, the attackers leaked it pu publicly, which means that Twitch knew about it, right? They announced it. Had they kind of kept this private, it could have been worse. Um, but this was reputational damage that this happened. Even though this wasn't the, the biggest security that could have been reported on, this, this was Twitch's reputation that was damaged um, as a result of that. So obviously, there can be... Uh, consequences on that and also incurring financial losses now there's also regulations around the type of data that cut that um, companies and the the security implications that they have around it if your source code eventually leads to access to uh, private information users information this can really lead to some financial uh, litigation and also some um, other damaging areas in terms of being uncompliant. So there's lots of different ways uh, of, of why source code is bad. Uh, so um, one of the other ones that we always talk about is hard-coded credentials. So I, talk, I said multiple times now <laughs> that we found 6,000 credentials in the Twitch's breach. So we've done analysis on lots of the main breaches that have happened recently. So uh, we looked at Microsoft, we looked at NVIDIA and Samsung. We reviewed how many secrets were in their source code. Spoiler alert, they all have secrets uh, in, in their source code. You can take a look at that um, with examples of the type of secrets that we've found uh, that we've found in there. And then there's also other security researchers that have done reports on the other types of vulnerabilities um, that are in that are in these uh, these source codes. So it's it can be quite a damaging uh, kind of uh, application to have your source code leaked. And now I just want to take a little, a little bit dive, um, and then I'll stop trying to scare everyone. I'll calm down. <laughs> I'll calm down in a minute. Um, but I just, I just cherry pick a couple of interesting examples based on on what we see. I don't want to spend too much time on this. I have other deep dives into these topics, but you know, like looking at how source code leaks have really actually affected companies. So one of the the best examples is Nvidia. So Nvidia's source code was leaked out by Lapsus. Um, it's not super clear exactly how Lapsus gained access to that source code, but it could have been a number of different reasons. But what's fundamental is that there was a bunch of secrets in that. Critical of most critical were some signing keys, and we know that malware was signed using Nvidia's keys. And this is when the issue of leaked credentials can be a very complicated problem because I have the two keys here, and you'll see under the valid from that both of these keys were expired. One expired in 2014, one expired in 2018. Logic should mean that these wouldn't be accepted anymore, but that's not how uh, these types of security credentials work because if you stopped accepting accepting them, older hardware or older fundamental software that hasn't been updated um, you know, could stop working. So it's very, very, very hard you know, to keep track of all of these and even expired keys can cause a problem. So these particular keys were probably buried deep into the history of NVIDIA, um, and a security researcher was able to find them and then still use them despite them uh, being uh, being invalid. And the other one we briefly talked about is misconfigurations from DevOps tools. So there was one uh, one interesting example, um, and probably the, the, the most relevant in this uh, was from Sonicube, 
but there was a security researcher that found out that he could access lots of private source code through misconfigured DevOps tools. So Sonar Cube, um, you know, is 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 a great tool. The vulnerability wasn't with Sonar Cube itself, but uh, because it's so easy to misconfigure it when you set these things up. Um, you know, it, it becomes a vulnerability for those using it. And, you know, in this case, their security reach, researcher was actually able to gain access to hundreds of different companies' private source code through these DevOps tools. And then uh, this particular researcher actually published uh, this source code uh, on, a, on, a Git, uh, on a Git server. Uh, so these were actually out there in the open. Um, and he did comply with the DMCA takedowns as they came through, but the companies had to make those. And a lot of the companies never actually filed a DMCA takedown uh, of the of the source code that was leaked because of this researcher, uh, and that is because they simply had no way of knowing that it exists there. All right, so I'm now going to invite Toma uh, to uh, uh, kind of join in here. Now that I've I've sufficiently scared everyone, or hopefully I have. That was the goal. So I'm going to come in and scare everyone, and then Tom is going to come in and calm everyone down and say how we can uh, solve this problem. <laughs> but uh, uh, Toma, thanks for thanks for thanks for being in here, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, how we're going to detect these leaks uh, on, on GitHub. So, uh, just as a reminder, you probably know that uh, that GitHub is the largest uh, code sharing platform. Um, that we have. So as a reminder of how big it is, you know, 73 million developers are on GitHub, uh, and this is absolutely huge. So Tom, my like, first question is kind of at the scale of this. Why, why is it why is it detecting code so different, difficult at the scale of, of GitHub? You're on mute if you're there. Can you hear me, Tomar? You're still on mute. Hang on, I'll unmute you. Nope, I can't unmute you. Um, can you unmute yourself in StreamYard? Oh. Yeah, sorry. Some issue with my, with my mic. Do you hear me okay, Mike? I hear you okay now, loud and clear. So I was just saying, you know, what what are some of the what are some of the issues uh, when it comes hello, to? Hello. No. So, like we say, GitHub is the biggest code sharing platform. In fact, developers say uh, GitHub is a like social 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 coding platform. So, a lot of things happen in GitHub. A lot of collaboration, a lot of project gather thousands of developers. So it's really something big. It's around 73 million developers today. 16 million developers joined in 2021. So it's still big. In 2021 alone, 61 million repository were created on the, on the platform. This is where open source is written. Like every big open source project is maintained on GitHub, whether it is Terraform, Kubernetes, uh, Rails, Ruby, everything's on GitHub. So it's a lot, a lot of work. And in fact, Coach Shaker, which he, who is a Git evangelist and uh, one of the co-founder on GitHub, invested in Git Guardian in 2019. So we kind of really close with GitHub, and we are we are really close to the technology and to the ecosystem. And and um, what what does that kind of so render the challenge? If you want to go to slide, uh, Mac. Okay, so you know at Guardian we are specialized in uh, securing code source in um, by preventing a secret sprawling. So that means usually what we do is uh, we look at source code and we prevent uh, secrets to be written in it. So I think it was a question on the on the on the chat. So yes, we have a pre-commit that forbids you to commit secret, for example. That's something that's always great. But we wanted to, to do more. So we've been monitoring publicly GitHub for almost four years. So we have a database of 15 billion patches. I mean, really 15 billion. So that's a lot of things. And we wanted to, to go deeper. We wanted to, to investigate if we could prevent IP leaks the same way we prevent 
secret, secret sprawling. Uh, that's why we, we started this initiative of uh, Has My Colleague. So what we do with Has My Colleague is really, um, is really simple. When you use GitHub, each file you commit has a specific signature. It's called the SHA-1. And with that specific signature, you can look for matches from your private data into public data. So what we do is just we look for matches. So a lot of things in the code is, is boilerplated. Like you start a new React project, you're going to have a lot of code generated by React. So that code, if it's in your private repository and in public repository, it, it's OK. I mean, no one cares about that code. But what we discovered is that usually what leaks not especially one file or one part of a file, it's a whole repository. So once in a while, you get a lot of matches between private and public. And that's what we, we want to look at. And that's what we built that tool we, that allows you to fingerprint your, your code using git shawan and to look for those, those shawan in public GitHub. So the product is built in two parts. You have one part, which is a utility that you need to install on your machine. So you need to install it in the command line. So it's really for the for the developer inside inside you, and uh, you re don't, don't you don't risk anything because the code is fully open source. You can look at the code just some uh, some golang some golang packages, and we just look at your VCS, clone the, clone the repositories, take take uh, the shell one out, and uh, and output it to to, uh, to a JSON file. I'm gonna sh I'm gonna show you everything uh, right afterward. Then you need to just need a token to connect to your to your VCS. So the computation is done on your local machine. So we don't have access to your files. There is just no breach in that way. It's completely secure. You just send us fingerprints, which is basically useless for, from our point if you want to steal your, your data. And if you leak it, and we look for matches. And then you upload your your uh, your signatures to our server and we look for matches on public GitHub. Then we, we crunch the data because there is a lot of data to crunch. And when we have a result, we send you an email with access to a nice dashboard where you can see what repositories are safe and what repositories are not, if any. So okay. I just so run the, I just run it a few minutes ago. I'm not sure I got, the results right. Okay. Can you hear me, Thomas? Can 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 other people in the in the stream hear me? I don't think Thomas can hear me, but can someone can am I is my mic still on? So Matt, do you want me to make a, a small demo of the of the command line interface? Uh, yeah, yeah, I would love to, but I'm not sure if you can hear me. Uh, I can tell you, but can you thumbs up or thumbs down? Okay, so uh, I'm going to sh I'm going to share my screen. So Okay, so you having a look at my terminal. So, like I said, the, we have a util which is a, a CLI util which is written in uh, Golang. So it's called SRC fingerprint. And if you're using macOS and you're using Homebrew, you can install it just by running it. that simple command. So it's a tap. So it's already updated, so I won't have anything to do. So then you have to run 
a simple command. So what you're going to do is pass the VCS token as an argument, then and then you're going to use instance fingerprint that will collect and target your provider. So if you're using GitHub Enterprise and GitHub Outprem, you can specify a specific host. If you use GitLab, you can just specify GitLab.GitLab. If you're using GitLab on-prem, you can still uh, specify the, the host. We only check the private files because if we check the public files, we are sure to have matches on the public GitHub data. And we're just agreeing to clone your repositories and generate uh, fingerprints. So I have around 50 repositories on my personal GitHub account, and I'm just going to compute it right now. So what you need to know is that the limit will be the, your bandwidth. If you have like a low bandwidth, it may take time to download the repositories. But if you have a nice, nice bandwidth, it's going quite fast. We are already at 20, 20 repositories. So you see it's quite it's quite fast. I got one big repo, so it takes more time for, for this one. So it's a it's a real demo. We don't we don't speed up. We don't speak things, <laughs> things up. As, as I said, okay. I know, so I know Tom I can't hear me. But, uh, <laughs> one minute and one second. So I think it's quite fast. Uh, maybe not the world record, but uh, just the time to to have a to have a nice glass of water. So what you see is that we generated that file, which is fingerprint.jsonl.gz. So I'm just going to to un unzip that file to show you what's okay. So I got it. I got a nice JSON L, and I'm going to show you what's inside the file. So as we can see, there is really nothing that may uh, that is sensitive there. You have the repository name, so that is clearly not sensitive, the size, the file path, and just the shell, like they say, which is the signature to us. So this file is really not sensitive, and uh, that's one of the great thing of that um, of that um, of that approach is that you really safe from your side, and even if you lose that uh, that file or if your data gets stolen, it's completely okay. So what we're going to do after, and I'm going to have to stop my screen and reshare it. So I, ju I just go to has my code leaked and go to the bottom of the page and I can choose to drop a file. So I got my json.gzip I'm adding my email. I'm opposing my, my file shares. And okay, thank you. We're waiting for for an email. So I, this time I'm going to cheat a little bit and uh, show you directly the results. But I've run, I've run the uh, command like five minutes ago, so it's really really. Um, it's really fast if you have small, small data like me. So what, what we see here is that, for example, maybe I want to check that uh, 
a specific repository of mine is really safe. So I know WorkIt is uh, important for me. OK, WorkIt, my favorite repository is safe. So then I, I want to investigate maybe what is high risk and what like, I, should, I should check. So what I do is I'm going to play with the features. So I'm going to check which one are high risk. So I see I only have repositories with, uh, with one specific repositories that match. That means that's really specific. Remember that we are we are comparing our data against 15 billion of patches. So that's a lot. It's uh, against millions of repositories. So when you have only one match, and then that, that's spooky. And then you have that really interesting thing is that the unique matches. So like I said, when you write code, you have a lot of boilerplate. You use a lot of boilerplate from from uh, libraries and a lot of generated code from uh, from your, your libraries. So this code, we don't really care. But you have everything that you write yourself. Like all that small things where you put on your love and knowledge, really that to where, where you create some values and sometimes you put some secrets and sometimes you have some vulnerability, vulnerabilities. So those files, they really are unique. They are really unique files. So it's really unique. It's really unique. So we have the data unique, and we're gonna look. We're gonna take the one with that have more than 50 50 percent uniqueness. Okay. So there is vinyl ruby. What is that? Oh, it's a Twitch. It's on Twitch. So, in fact, I cheated a little bit. So, like we said, the Twitch data got leaked uh, a few months ago. So we had a look at it to find some secrets, and we wanted to check that have there been any leak from Twitch on uh, on GitHub. And in fact, there was a whole repository that came that that uh, surfaced in GitHub the day after Twitch got uh, got breached. It was that repository was called Twitch Open Source, and it has been taken down by GitHub. So unfortunately, if I go now, and if I if I don't do that, but if I do Twitch, so the 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 user has disappeared. But before that, we used to see that the content was blocked by DMCA by DMCA complaint. So it's really interesting to see that we come back to the DMCA complaint. In fact, if we look at, at Twitch data, so I'm just going to have to circle back to find, to find it. Let me just a few seconds so I can turn it back in that is today. Okay, so I'm going to show you for Twitch. So it takes a bit longer to a bit longer to to load because we. Sorry, screen. I'm sorry, I didn't cheat on this one, so we have the real loading time. So what we can see from Twitch, 
is that there are lots of repo that has been put to uh, to to give up the the after they were breached. So it's uh, around one. Hour. They have four pages. So that really, really, really is a lot of, uh, it's around 350 repository that were uploaded to GitHub after the bridge. So that's a lot of thing. And obviously, I think they have been looking, so they saw the, they saw the link on GitHub straight away. But just imagine someone uploads a bit of a repo or just one repository right now, it may, it may be unnoticed. So that really what that, that project is about is about checking that your private data is safe. And just if it's not safe, you can ask for DMCA take down, you can take actions, and you know that you've been breached. So that's really the, the power of that product. And I think everybody, everybody should, should use it. It's free. So you can, you can be safe and, uh, and be sure that you, you, you've not been breached and, um, and that your repositories are, are safe in your, in your private VCS. Um, that's especially important if you have like a sensitive repository that you want to track. Um, or for example, more trivial facts, if you, if you do some coding interviews, a lot of them end up on GitHub too. Or if you um, if you are an independent developer, we see a lot of things uh, right, that copy, like for example, uh, Chrome extension, uh, video game extension, and so on. So it's really a powerful tool uh, that really detects that kind of uh, of breaches where the where the repositories are are mirrored on GitHub, and that also addresses the issue with fat fingers when one of the developer mistakenly push repository to public GitHub instead of your private GitHub or your on uh, on-prem instance. And that happens more than uh, <laughs> more than we think. And uh, that's uh, that's really about it. So for Twitch, what is good is that everything was linked to that uh, user Twitch open source. So it's uh, something great for them. And you can see that the example of a, of a file that is common across uh, several uh, repositories. So, okay, I'm gonna give back the mic to you, uh, to you, Mac. And I'm just gonna have to to check my headphones because I have no sound for five minutes. So I hope you hear me okay, but I'm not hearing anything. Can you? You can't hear me now. Oh, I hear you now. Okay. Oh so yes, then, thank goodness. Okay, okay, we're good. Okay, was... so I think that was it for the demo. Um, I think it's time for question or Q and A. I think that's the. Yes, yes, yes. Time for Q and A. So let me just pull up um, my slides again here. Um, thanks for that. Now I I have some questions because I wasn't able to talk to you. I was dying on this <laughs> because I, um, I had so many things I wanted to ask. But uh, we're going to look through. We already have some great questions on on Crowdcast. So, but what I wanted to ask you is for those that maybe don't know, you mentioned. 15 billion patches that we have you know what 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 exactly is is a patch um you know what what is that database that we're scanning that we have 15 billion patches of for those that maybe don't know exactly what that is okay so i think you're all familiar with the with your code file so you have a file where all your code is and but every time a you do a commit you make a small change to a file so in fact your file now it's just the sum of changes you've made since you created it. So, for example, if you say if you create um, a file, you write push test, you commit it. The first patch is just push test. So, what is a patch? 
is a difference between two states of a file and between two commits. So in, a, in Apache, you have deletion and addition. And uh, if you go to uh, any commit on GitHub, what you're going to see is the differences in files, and those are the patches. Not sure it was really clear because it's really uh, nerdy. But <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I think that's clear. I think that's clear too. Uh, now we have some um, some questions here uh, in our question section. So. Um, one one question here uh, is that have you have you considered adding vulnerability uh, adding functions to alert uh, for called modules which themselves contain vulnerabilities? So this is kind of like talking about uh, scanning the code itself for for vulnerabilities. So I mean, um, obviously this isn't isn't scanning the code, but this might be a good area to talk about. You know, the relationship with Guardian's products, which scan source code for secrets, uh, and how that fits in. Uh, with has my code leaked? It was a really long question. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I think that's uh, that's complementary. That's uh, the um, secrets. Obviously, that's really really important to check. And when you have a secret leak, uh, you need to address it now. It's uh, it's a no brainer. For, for IP detection, it's more like uh, it's good to be alerted and take action, but usually it's not uh, like a life or death situation. So currently, we are working on imp on, um, on porting the product I've just demoed into our uh, internal monitoring product. So the idea will be for users to have both their secrets monitored in one place and the IPD detection uh, running in background. So they are, they are secure for you know, on, on both dimensions. We, we think at the Guardian that the security is a lot about, uh, there are a lot of, uh, of thing, different things that means that your code is secure. And currently we are working on uh, these different things to make you sure that one day all your code is secure. And secret right. is one thing. Uh, IP leaks are one of, one, of, one of the things, but uh, there are still many things to come. Right, great. Uh, that's exciting to hear from. We have another question here is, how do we filter out proprietary code from known kind of open source shared libraries, um, areas like that? So how do we distinguish between between uh, the open source code, and you kind of touched on this, in your project and and kind of finding that out in, in other shared libraries? Yeah, that's really really good question. In fact, we that's one of the first thing we, we stumble across. Uh, in fact, when you have open source code, it's present. Uh, you can find it a lot in, on GitHub. That means we're gonna find a lot of matches for, from that code on uh, on public GitHub. So when we have a file that's become common, we say it's a common file. We say it's a non important. So if you have a repository with a lot of boilerplates, a lot of open source code, or, we, or if, you have, if you forked a project, it won't, be, it won't be shown as high risk. Because we only show as high risk repository that have unique matches. So matches that are significant enough to be considered uh, dangerous for us. It's okay, not so you have a two hundred percent, but uh, but we we still we still we we get rid of the obvious false positive false false positives. Okay, now we have another question here um, about uh, if we're matching the file version type, if we're kind of doing these fingerprints, um, you know, couldn't someone just add in some random you know random white spaces to create a unique you know hash file, for example? <laughs> So, um, you know, you talked a little bit about, you know, how whole repositories are, uh, are leaked. So, you know, what, what, what is the likelihood of kind of someone stealing your code and, and, and changing it slightly um, to avoid that detection? Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. If, if we wanted to, to find some lookalike code, like you have a nice algorithm and someone uh, studied it, but uh, use the different ID or uh, use the linter to change it, to change uh, the ordering of the method, for example. Unfortunately, we won't catch it. We need to, we can only catch 
um, like uh, exact ma exact matches. We are limited to exact matches, but the real use case we are targeting is not someone who is stealing a bit of code uh, from from his uh, employer. It's not that we are we are um, watching at. What we are really watching at is someone who mirrors a repository, a complete repository, someone who steals a, a, a repository. That really, to us, was really the, that issue we wanted to focus on, that repository that leaked completely. Because usually, when there is a leak, it's not one file. It's a lot of files and a lot of repos. So we didn't want to focus on finding the, the, those small, uh, small, uh, small things in code. We wanted to to look for the for really the, the big uh, the big issues and uh, the big problems. Right, cool. Now we have a couple of questions here that uh, maybe I'll quickly take. We have one from Gerald that's talking about. Uh, he said that uh, you've noticed that our free version of Git Guardian uh, is only free for. Oh, I think that question's gone now. But anyway, I'll still answer it. Oh, here we are. It's free for up to twenty five. From Employees for public repos only. Not actually true. Um, if if you have less than twenty five developers and you want to use our full business plan uh, for Git Guardian, then all you need to do is email support at gitguardian.com uh, with your company name, how many employees you currently have, and we will upgrade you for free to the complete business plan. Um, so it's a bit of a manual process, but uh, it's 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 the checks and balances we have in there. So anyway, that's a question I can answer. Yay! <laughs> all right. Um, now we, we talked. You talked a little bit about this, but we have a question about uh, what what determines the, you know like the, the the severity, the high risk. So you, you talked about this uh, a little bit before, but but um, you know like how exactly is that high risk, low risk calculated in that severity? Okay, so uh, we have three different buckets. So we have high risk, low risk, and uh, category that we call unknown because we didn't find a better name. Sorry. Uh, so low risk first. Uh, low risk, low risk. It means we did not find uh, unique matching. So every matching we found were really common. So we, to us, to us, it was labeled as boilerplate, and we have nothing uh, that's specific enough to give us a hint that you have a, a leak. And you have a number, and most of the files have no uh, no um, no match. On, uh, on Big Data. So the, these repositories, we label them as safe. On the other side, we have the high risk repositories. That means they have a high uh, recall for unique matches and a high, uh, high percentage of the files that are contained in the repositories have matches. So for human, human decide, it means that a lot of files uh, are found on public GitHub. And because, like we said, we have a lot of files on GitHub, uh, that's not just random, usually. So if, we ha if you have one of your private repository that is shown as high risk, that means there are uh, repositories that are really close to, to yours. So there is one thing you can look at on the report there. Say you can order the um, the report using the colon number of repository matching. And if you if you have only like one repository that matches with a high number of unique match of unique uh, of unique file matching that we said, it means basically it's the same it's the same repository. Got it. So so that's uh, really really uh, the way we did that. So. Still, we are still young on that on that part. Like the secret, we've been doing that for for years now. So we are quite confident with secrets. With IPDX, a bit less. But that method, yes, we're gonna have false positives. But like we show you, we we just show, show you with Twitch. Um, when there are matches, we will find them. Got it. Got it. And, and of course, I mean, as a new tool, this is definitely going to be improving. Now, we're almost at the end of the hour, uh, but I do we have a couple of questions and then we'll wrap up with some uh, some prizes announcements. But uh, there's some questions about using this tool on GitLab and and um, and Bitbucket. Um, you know, can we can we can we use this tool? Uh, 
uh, on on GitLab or, or Bitbucket repositories. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming the answer is yes, we can fingerprint the code from Bitbucket and GitLab. Yeah, yeah, we, the, uh, yes, you can only check for public files on github.com. So the public part will only, will only be github.com, but you can uh, fingerprint your code on uh, GitHub, GitHub on-prem, GitLab, GitLab on-prem, and Bitbucket on-prem, and Bitbucket. The right, only yeah. limitation is that you need to, the project need to be based on Git and not on uh, other, uh, other tools like uh, SVN or Mercurial. Right, yeah. And, and you know, it is important to know is, is the scale of GitHub. In terms of open source, you know, GitHub is a place where its code is going to leak out publicly. Uh, when it comes to, to Bitbucket or, or GitLab, you know, there's a lot more focused on enterprise customers um, being private. Uh, so there's not as much open source, uh, you know, kind of communities uh, there. But, all right. Moving on. So uh, prizes. So we do have some participation. Now, I do want to say that uh, we have some Amazon gift cards to give away. And uh, we're going to be giving these away to people that are using the tool that attended this webinar. So if you attend this webinar, uh, use that tool. Use the same email that you used to sign up for this one um, to give it a go. And I will be able to email you and let you know. I will select some people and let them know if they've won an Amazon gift card. But... Uh, I'm just going to pull up some analytics of some of the most uh, uh, active people in this. And it's going to give me a number. I'm just crunching some numbers at the moment. Here we go. All right. So uh, we have a very active user who's in his uh, second stream. Now, um, the I don't know if I can pronounce this name, so I'm going to post it in the chat. I don't know. This is I had to do this last time too, and I did, and I got the name wrong as well. Uh, and so here we are. I'll, I'll give it an attempt, and I apologize if I get this name wrong. But Olawafi me Ibinzi Ibinzizer. Well, I'm very sorry. I think I butchered your name, but um, uh, congratulations. You've won a, a swag bag. Um, uh, along, along with Edvana, um, so I'll post in the slides too. So congratulations. I'll email you um, with, uh, with details, um, and I'll get a, a postal address from you, and we'll send out that swag bag. So again, I apologize about that name, <laughs> but I gave it an attempt. But uh, at this point, I'd like to thank everyone for, for joining this, this live stream. And Toma, particularly, I would like to thank you. Uh, I know we had some technical difficulties uh, in this one. Um, so thanks for staying with us. Um, but uh, we, there will be a recording afterwards. And we will be publishing lots more information about this. So make sure you follow uh, Git Guardian on the, the, relevant, uh, the re relevant channels. And um, uh, we look forward to, to seeing, you, seeing you all. These webinars are monthly, so also make sure you follow us on, uh, on, uh, on Crowdcast. Um, that way you'll get notified whenever the one is. So again, uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, that concludes the, the, the webinar for today. So thanks again, and uh, look forward to see you guys next time.